Okay, everyone able to see the slideshow? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma okay, good. Okay, so the second half of the first chapter of Arjuna Vishadha Yoga. Quick review. Liberal nature of the Brahmanas. I think you've all got that. Duryodhana, Duryodhana's diplomacy. Now, if you look at text number 8 in the first chapter, who's speaking? Yes? Duryodhana. Right? Duryodhana speaking, right? And he's addressing his assembled warriors, the great fighters, and he says, there are personalities like you. Who is that you? Drona. Drona Chai. Right. So, Drona's name comes first. He says Drona before Bhishma. That's his diplomacy. Why does he say Drona first? Because Drona is the Brahman. And the Brahmins are given respect before the Kshatriyas. Even though Bhishma is senior in other ways, but Drona is the Brahman. So he respects him before he respects Bhishma. Of course, Kripa is also there. Kripa is also Brahman. But anyway, he gave more respect to Drona. That was his diplomacy. We spoke about Prabhupada's uh, statement about violence and Vaishnavas. Important how to understand these things when Prabhupada mentions them. Don't be fanatic. So the overview of the first chapter, you have this in your teaching material in the, in the uh, student handbook. Right? Five sections, Dhritarashtra's doubt, Duryodhana's diplomacy, and then the signs of victory for the Pandavas. Right? What were the signs of victory again? Someone? Kamakshetra Kurukshetra. The Kurukshetra, yes, yeah, because it's Kurukshetra, it's the Dharmakshetra, so that's a, a good help for the Pandavas, who are more inclined. My presence. Yes? What? The presence of uh, Madhava, the husband of the goddess of fortune, Krishna was on the side of the Pandavas. Okay, presence of the goddess of fortune through Krishna. The chariot given by Agni. Sorry? The, chari Marat, the chariot given by Agni okay, to Arjuna Ar and Ar the presence of Hanuman is the chariot of the flag. Okay, Hanuman on the flag, an indestructible chariot given by Agni. Something else? Uh, the Divya Sankam, the conch shell. Okay, the conch shells, the blowing of the conch shell shatters the hearts of the Kauravas. Aparyaptam and Paryaptam. Aparyaptam and Paryaptam. Yes, you want to explain more? Since Krishna was on the side of Pandava, the victory is Pariyap. And uh, since Krishna was not on the side of the Kauravas, the victory is a Pariyap. I mean, they cannot achieve the victory, and over here they can achieve the victory. Okay, thank you. And then Krishna is Bhaktavatsala? Krishna, Achyuta. Krishna is Achyuta, but he's Achyuta. controlled by the pure love of the devotion of Arjuna. And that's where he takes orders or instructions from Arjuna. And then Arjuna's four reasons for not fighting. We're going to look at that today. The four reasons for not fighting. 
discussed in the first chapter. Okay, going ahead, Rishikesha, Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is Rishikesha. He's a, Rishikesha means what? Rishikesh means? Rish Lord of senses. Hmm? Master of senses. The Lord, the master, master of the senses, right. We say Rishikesha Rishikena Sevanam Bhaktir Uchate. We should use our senses in the service of the proprietor of the senses, Lord Krishna. So Lord Krishna is addressed in this way in the 24th verse of the first chapter. And then Lord Krishna is also addressed as Gudakesha. So he's both Rishikesh and Gudakesh. In this verse, Arjuna is referred to as Gudakesh. <laughs> I'm saying Krishna is yeah, Arjuna's Gudakesh. Krishna's Rishikesh and Arjuna's Gudakesh. Gudakesh means sleep, and one who conquers sleep is called Gudakesh. Sleep also means ignorance. So Arjuna conquered both sleep and ignorance because of his friendship with Krishna. As a great devotee of Krishna, he could not forget Krishna even for a moment because that is the nature of a devotee. Either in waking or in sleep, a devotee of the Lord can never be free from thinking of Krishna's name, form, qualities and pastimes. Thus a devotee of Krishna can conquer both sleep and ignorance simply by thinking of Krishna constantly. Right? Of, who are the examples of this? Who conquers sleeping? Arjuna. Arjuna, yes. Yeah. Mariji, you got to do something about your mic, Mariji. Somebody else tell the six, me? The six Goswamis. The six Goswamis, okay. The six Goswamis are described and the Goswami has to come. What? Okay. He was very, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was, you know, I'm still trying to comment on the six Goswamis. Can you just give me one minute, please? Yes, 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 Maharaj. Sorry. The six Goswamis, they conquered over eating and sleeping. By, because they were always remembering Krishna, and they were always engaged in chanting the holy name and glorifying Krishna. And so they were not servants of their senses. Prabhupada, gave the title Goswami to uh, Satsvarupa and Ridayananda Maharajis in Los Angeles, I think it was in 1972, maybe 73, and he gave them the title Goswami. And so they asked him, what does it mean, Goswami? And so Srila Prabhupada told them, you study this song Goswami Astikam. He said, that will tell you what it means to be Goswami. So in the Goswami Astikam, which is written by Srinivasacharya, he describes there, Nidrahara Vihara Kadi Jivito Chaitanya Divyochano. Right? That they conquered over Nidra and Ahara. They conquered over sleeping and eating. Prabhupada also said, he said, when I was a young man, I conquered over mating and defending. And he said, now in my old age, I have also conquered, given up eating and sleeping. Uh, that was it, it was given up, it wasn't just conquered, but he, gave, he said, I gave up mating and defending as a young man. He said, now in my old age, I have also given up eating and sleeping. And so here in the Bhagavad Gita, we have Arjuna who also conquered over sleep and ignorance because of his friendship with Krishna. Prabhupada would often chastise us for sleeping too much. He said, sleep is like ignorance. And if you were sitting in class 
and you had your eyes closed, then Prabhupada may say, you're sleeping, wake up. And so there was at least one occasion when Prabhupada corrected a devotee, he said, you're sleeping. The devotee responded, he said, no Prabhupada, I'm not sleeping. He said, my eyes were closed, but I wasn't sleeping. And Prabhupada responded, he said, if your eyes are closed and you're not moving, you are asleep. <laughs> Prabhupada did not, he did not like devotees to argue with him when he was just or pointing out faults in them. So here in the Bhagavad Gita we have Arjuna's example that he could conquer over sleep. And he also conquered over ignorance. Prabhupada says sleep also means ignorance. Because when we sleep, we're not conscious, although it's mentioned here that uh, it was mentioned about no, never forgetting Krishna, but uh, We, we see that uh, most, most ordinary people, when they sleep, they don't remember Krishna. We simply dream of material life. We simply dream of sense gratification. But the nature of the pure devotee, like Arjuna, that they never forget Krishna, either in waking or in sleeping. So that's a very fortunate position. We don't get that position very easily. But to come to that stage, we have to apply our minds thinking about Krishna constantly. We have to intensify our remembrance of Krishna. All right, so going ahead, we, he we hear uh, Arjuna in. Uh, he was asking Krishna, bring my chariot in the midst of the battlefield. I want to see who is assembled here. And then Lord Krishna brings the chariot into the middle of the battlefield. And he points out, he says to him, Bhishma Drona Paramukata. In front of Bhishma and Drona, Parta, O son of Prita, Pashyaitan Samvetan Kurun. Iti. Just behold the Kurus. Text number 25. Just look, Arjuna, there's the Kurus right in front of Bhishma and Drona. Krishna had brought the chariot in front of the opposing army, and there he could see, Arjuna could see Bhishma and Drona. Bhishma, of course, grandfather, and Drona his beloved teacher. And there's Arjuna. And so this is a cause for Arjuna's affection to be aroused and Arjuna becomes bewildered by the situation, thinking that I have to fight against these people who are my seniors and who are my worshipable persons and who I have loving relationship with. So going ahead, from the purport of text number 25, Prabhupada has written, Krishna never expected such things from the son of his aunt, Prita. The mind of Arjuna was thus predicted by the Lord in friendly joking. The mind of Arjuna. What is the condition of Arjuna's mind? Bewildered. Bewildered. In what way? What Affection is... towards his relatives. His uh, guru. Sorry? He, he was uh, more affectionate towards his guru and relatives standing in front of him. He was affected by the presence of his guru and his other relatives opposing him in the battle. So Arjuna was 
certainly confused. Is it proper to fight in this battle? And Prabhupada's noting that Lord Krishna could predict this. Actually, of course, Lord Krishna had arranged the bewilderment of Arjuna. Lord Krishna had arranged this in order to allow the speaking of Bhagavad Gita. Text 26. There, Arjuna could see within the midst of the armies of both parties, his fathers, his fathers, how many fathers did Arjuna have? Anybody? Who are the fathers of Arjuna? Burishwara. Who is he? Who is Burishwara? Burishwara uh, is uh, from Arjuna's mother's side. I'm not sure. Why would he be his father? Anyway, grandfathers, grandfather, of course we know Bhishma is one grandfather. Any other grandfathers? Teachers. Who is the teacher? Dronacharya and Kripacharya. Maternal uncles? Maternal uncles? That may be Burishrava you were speaking about from Shakuni, the mother's... Shakuni, huh? Shakuni Mama. Shakuni can be considered middle. Shakuni? Really? No? Okay. Brothers? Who are the brothers? Duryodhana. Duryodhana. All the brothers, yeah. Sons? Sons of Duryodhana and other brothers. Grandsons? Likes of Abhimanyu. Who? Who? Sons of Duryodhana. sons on the other side. So the sons, Duryodhana had sons who had already sons. But you know, we could also understand on some of these things, relatives are in Arjuna's family. It's not that they all have to be in Duryodhana's family, from Duryodhana's side. They could be on the side of Arjuna. It could be the sons of the Pandavas, and Abhimano, he has his, he's there also, he's a grandson. Son, no, his son, right. It's Maharaj Pariksha's grandson, right. Okay, who's the grandson? Any? Do we know any grandsons there? I can't think of any. I have to look in Surrender Unto Me. It's all in the Surrender Unto Me. They're, men, they're named there. Friends and also his fathers-in-law and well-wishers. Okay, so you can get more details if you look in Surrender Unto Me. Barijan Prabhu has uh, listed each of the names of these different people who meet this relationship. Maharaj, uh, father can be because Arjuna was, a, was also son of uh, Indra and he's also Pandu. So, okay. Uh, Pandu Arjuna, Indra, Arjuna. Father. Arjuna is the son of Indra, and his father is Pandu. Okay. Uh, but yeah. none of them are in the battle, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, who's in the battle? Indra is not in the battle. Correct. Yeah. His father's. The spiritual father and material father. Mm, maybe. I don't know. Does he have. Can we say Drona? Who is the spiritual father of Arjuna? Kripa, is it? Lord 
Lord Krishna. Yes, Kripacharya was the Rajaguru of the whole clan. Yeah, he was the Rajaguru, right. Krishna is the father of uh, the spiritual father of Arjuna, but Krishna is also his friend. And Krishna is also a relative. Anyway, uh, we have to refer to surrender unto me to get all the details of this. Okay, so the four reasons for Arjuna not wanting to fight, also given to you in your student handbook. You'll see these four reasons are listed. So we're going to look at them a little bit today. Compassion, first of all. Kripaya paraya vishto. Arjuna became overwhelmed with a high grade compassion. Text number 27. Arjuna's overwhelmed. Compassion, an, 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 an important quality for devotees, right? We, we offer our respects to the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord who are uh, full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. So we should also be compassionate. And Ar Arjuna is also overwhelmed with a high-grade compassion. Arjuna's compassion, however, has a problem, right? What's the problem with Arjuna's compassion? It's material matter, it's for the body. Yes, his compassion was based on the body, right. That's the problem. So from Prabhupada's lecture, the other side, Duryodhan, why he did not think in that way? Why Arjuna is thinking? Because he is devotee. That is the difference. A devotee thinks like that. A devotee does not like to kill anyone, even an ant. So many atrocities were done to him. Still, when the question of killing came, he was not very happy. No, this is Vaishnava. He is ready to excuse even the greatest enemy. So, this is Prabhupada describing Arjuna's compassion and the particular quality of a devotee. That a devotee is ready, he's tolerant, he's ready to forgive even the greatest enemy. The devotee doesn't like to even kill insects. If there were many mosquitoes in Prabhupada's room, he wouldn't be happy if somebody came in and started killing them all. He would say, why are you making my room into a crematorium? He called one devotee over one day, he said, you see this insect on the table? He said, oh Prabhupada, you want me to throw it out of here? Prabhupada said, I want you to think how to give it Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada had that mode, he was concerned with compassion for all living entities. And real compassion is to give them Krishna consciousness. So Arjuna's reason for not to fight. Arjuna Uvacha, Siddhanti Mam Gatrani. I feel the limbs of my body quivering. Arjuna was not a coward. It was not out of fear that the limbs of his body were quivering. Why was his body quivering? What would be the reason why he would feel the limbs of his body quivering? Anybody? Because of grief, Maharaj. Because of grief. Well, he hadn't done anything yet to grieve. But 
but he knew the consequences of what would uh, happen if he would fight. Raj sings he don't want to uh, kill his own kinsman, so he was, his body was creeping. And... Yes, I think it's due to his, uh, the difficulty which he has in making the decision, in trying to, in trying to, should he take part in the battle or not? It's such a difficult decision which he has to make. And just the thought of making this decision is causing his body to quiver. Mukam cha parishushyati, the mouth drying up to a greater degree. Mouth drying up. Again, the situation which Arjuna is finding himself in. It's causing him to experience these different emotions very perplexing situation. Should he fight or not? Prabhupada comments Dehatma Buddhi Swajanam so Arjuna was not a coward, he was a competent warrior. But still, the Hatma Buddhi, the bodily concept of life, is so strong that Arjuna admits, Drisvatu Swajanam Krishna. My dear Krishna, I have to kill my own man? What is that own man? Own man means this bodily relationship. Why others are not own man? Everyone is own man because everyone is Krishna's son. So when one becomes Krishna conscious, he can see everyone own man. And when he is not Krishna conscious, he simply sees own man where there is bodily relationship. This is the defect. So this is Arjuna's defect, that he's thinking in terms of bodily relationship. He doesn't see everyone as own man, everyone as Krishna's man, but he's making, he's making distinction, bodily defects. So, Dihatma Buddhi, one who thinks we are the body, and then this is a problem. So Lord Krishna has to guide his devotee out of this kind of illusion. So compassion has been talked about, and then Arjuna comes up with another reason why he doesn't want to fight. And this is, he thinks, I won't enjoy. Now, generally, our motivation for doing something is enjoyment. We want to enjoy. Maybe we don't enjoy doing it, but we want to enjoy at least the results of doing something. You go to work, you have a job. I mean, you may not enjoy the work, but you enjoy the fruit of the work. And so there's, there must be some enjoyment, it's the impetus behind every activity. So Arjuna is thinking, I don't want to fight because I won't be able to enjoy. Mentioned here, nimitani chapashyami viparitani, envisioned only painful reverses in the battlefield. He would not be happy even by gaining victory over the foe. He would not be happy. Why would he not be happy? <coughs> Why would he not be happy? He's going to gain victory because, over the foe. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes uh, um, since Arjuna was a king, 
and even if he would win the board battle um, there would be many people who would die so who would appreciate his valor so there would be nobody to appreciate his valor of winning the battle so that would not bring him happiness yes you're right very good yeah nobody would appreciate this not the, everybody if he fights a battle everyone's killed then who can he show off his uh, fruit the, the victory he, he doesn't have anyone to uh, show it off to so he won't enjoy it continuing with the same point Natashre o napashyami I do not foresee how any good can come. If Krishna says, can't you see, I am on your side, nakankshe vijayam krishna na cha rajyam sukhani cha. Text number 31. Arjuna can't see any good. Where's the good from it? Text number 31 says, I do not see how any good can come from killing my own kinsmen in this battle. Nor can I, my dear Krishna, desire any subsequent victory, kingdom, or happiness. So this is Arjuna's arguments to Krishna. Nor can I desire any subsequent victory, kingdom, or happiness. Victory, vijayam, kingdom, rajyam, and sukhani, happiness. So Arjuna thinking, I won't enjoy, no happiness. Why should I do it? No point. Prabhupada explains, so there are two things, shreyas and prayas. Shriyas. I remember, I don't know if it's still there, but there used to be one very popular sari shop, <laughs> sari shop in Calcutta, not far away from our temple. It was called Shriyas. Shriyas means what is ultimately beneficial, and Prayas means what is immediately beneficial. What, uh, praya, prayas and material. Shreyas is more concerned with the spiritual. <laughs> so the man called his sari shop Shreyas. Thought it's very interesting. So these two words are explained also in Chaitanya Charitamrita. And here also in Bhagavad Gita, in relation to Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada brings it up. He said there are two things here, Shreyas and Prayas. Here Arjuna is speaking of Shreyas. Shreyas means ultimate good, and prayas means immediately palatable. So here the problem is, what is shreyas? What is ultimately good? That is mistaken here. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita is required. Right? We need the Bhagavad Gita to understand what is actually shreyas. Continuing the same point, Prabhupada explains, he, meaning Arjuna, is thinking that Krishna is not so important. My family is important. My family, although he is devotee, therefore Kanista Adhikari. Kanista Adhikari meaning? in the lower stage of devotee, in the lower stage of devotion. One may be interested in Krishna consciousness, but his real interest is how to improve this material life. They are thinking that I can bring Krishna in the midst of my family, provided Krishna helps me to enjoy this material life. 
<laughs> this is the Kanista Adhikari. I will bring Krishna in the midst of my family, provided Krishna helps me to enjoy this material life. So that is not the highest devotion. That is rather, that is the lowest devotion. That is Kanista or the material, materialistic devotee. He's devotee, he's a devotee, but he has a lot of material attachments, a lot of material thinking, right? So Prabhupada's explaining Arjuna's situation here when he's thinking about enjoyment, that he's thinking about the family, not just thinking about Krishna. Kimboger, O oh Govinda, Arjuna is saying, O oh Govinda, of what avail to us are a kingdom, happiness, or even life itself, when all those for whom we may desire them are now arrayed on this battlefield? Arjuna is expressing his disapproval of the situation. That what's the point of having a kingdom? Why should we even worry, or even think about happiness? Our own, our own life is going to be useless. Because all the people who we may want to enjoy these things with, they may all die in the battlefield. They're all here on the battlefield. Nahatya drattarasrana Kapriti Svajjanardana. Of what pleasure will we derive from killing the sons of Dhritarashtra? So you can see Arjuna's devotion coming out. He's, although these sons of Dhritarashtra were so unfair in their dealings with the Pandavas, although uh, the Pandavas had suffered so many atrocities because of the dealings of the sons of Dhritarashtra, but still Arjuna didn't have the mood that he wanted to kill them. Although they tried to kill the Pandavas, but still Arjuna's mood was that, no, I, it's not so good, I don't want to kill them because they're our relatives and why, why should I kill them? I should kill them just so I can have a kingdom, just so I can be a king, so I can be a ruler. Remember, they had suggested to Duryodhan, at least give us enough land, give us one village, let us rule one village so that we can still be Kshatriyas. But Duryodhan said, no, we will not give him even enough land to go through the eye of a needle. So that was the situation that the Pandavas were faced, that they were going to have to give up being Kshatriyas practically, because Dhritarashtra's sons didn't want to give any land, even one village to them to rule. But Arjuna's thinking that, well, I, I don't want to kill them, I don't think it's good to fight. It's not proper. So Arjuna's showing himself as a devotee, not as a coward, but as a devotee. Prabhupada explains, a devotee will be more thoughtful when it comes to doing things. He's not going to act impulsively and rush out on the battlefield, where are they, I'm going to fight these people, I'm going to kill them. That is not the thinking of the devotee. The devotee thinks carefully before doing everything. Prabhupada explains about the enjoyment consideration. He says, everyone wants to show his opulence to friends and relatives, but Arjuna fears that all his relatives and friends will be killed on the battlefield and he will be unable to share his opulence after victory. Yes, if, if there's so much blood at stake, the lives of so many people, especially relatives and friends, they're all going to be killed on the battlefield. 
it takes away the pleasure of the victory. They won't be able to enjoy the opulence with so much guilt attached to it. And we actually see in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's described Maharaj Yudhisthira after the battle of Kurukshetra, how much he was concerned, how, how, diff, how he was really upset and he was very regretful that he'd been responsible for the death of so many people. And he had to come before Grandfather Bhishma and Grandfather Bhishma was able to pacify his mind but only by speaking for many days. Okay, going ahead. Sinful reactions. As devotees, we are also very cautious. We don't want to engage in any activities which are sinful, anything which is going to bring reactions on us. So Arjuna is also concerned like that. He thinks that if I fight, sinful reactions will be there. Because fighting means he's going to kill. He's going to at least injure and, and, and kill also people. So there will be reactions for this. We know Parasuram. Parasuram was an incarnation of Godhead. And he killed the Kshatriya race how many times? How many? 21 times. 21, 21. 21 times Parasuram killed the Kshatriya race, Kshatriya kings, 21 times. Did he have to atone for it? He was asked to. Huh? He has created the kernel of his. He was asked to perform tapasya, penance after that, to atone for that. Yes, he had to, he had to do penance after that. He did a lot of penance after that to atone for the killing of so many people. And we see also in Srimad Bhagavatam, Indra killed Vritasura. Now Vritasura was a demon, he was an Asura. And Indra killed him. But he had to do tapasya, he had sinful reactions. He had to perform sinful, he had to do some tapasya for quite a long time to get relief from the sinful reactions. So we have to be very careful about incurring sinful reactions. We are all very careful to strictly follow regulative principles. If we don't follow, we get reactions. And Arjuna is also concerned. Papam evasrayat asman. Sin will overcome us if we slay such aggressors. Even though these people are aggressors, Arjuna is worried about sinful reactions. Now, what was the acts of aggression which the Kauravas had performed against the Pandavas? What were some of the things they had done? Poison. Bhima was poisoned. Bhima, they tried to poison Bhima, yes? No, it's not Huh? They burned the palace. Yes, they sent the Pandavas to live in the palace, the Shellac house, and they set the whole thing on fire in the night. They thought they would burn them. They occupied yes. their land. In front of Draupadi, in front of uh, the they insulted Draupadi, tried to disrobe her in the presence of so many other men. And then, what was the other they, thing? They took away their land. They took away all the property, all the land, right? They took everything from the Pandavas. So, do the, do the Pandavas have a good reason to kill these people? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. According to Manu Samhita, they have to be killed. Huh? According to Manu Samhita, those can be killed. They can be killed. Well, I don't know about Manu Samhita. I don't know. Man, does Manu Samhita actually say that? Yes, Maharaj. Really? What does it say? 
I will give you the best man. Give me one second. Well, if somebody is a murderer, they can be hanged. That's Manusmita. But uh, aggressors, somebody takes away your wife. Can you go and you can go and kill him, or somebody takes your land, you can kill him. But it is stated that is according to Artha Shastra. Artha Shastra may allow us to slay the aggressors, but according to Dharma Shastra, it's not there. Dharma Shastras are a, a different from Artha Shastras. If you look at the Artha Shastras, then they will say, you can kill somebody, they take away your land, you have a right to kill them. But in Dharma Shastra, that is not there. So there are different opinions, different Shastras. It's a question of which level of Shastra are you going to act on? Maharaj, yes? what would be Niti Shastra? Maharaj, what would be Niti Shastra? Niti Shastra. Hmm. Niti Shastra. I would think that may also be Dharma Shastra. I don't know. I'd have to find out. I, I, I'm not sure. What What is the point? What's there in Niti Shastra? What does it say? I don't know, Maharaj. Oh, you don't know. <laughs> I just heard about Niti Shastra, so I wanted to know okay. what is like Dharma Shastra, Artha Shastra, Niti Shastra, and like, I mean, little just one sentence or about, like you explained Dharma Shastra and Artha Shastra. So I would just like wanted to know what was Niti Shastra, if you would know. No, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I, maybe we can find out from somebody else. So in the Manusamita Maharaj 8.350, Without consideration, one should kill the aggressors as there is no fault in killing them. One, without consideration, one should kill the aggressors. What is, who are these aggressors? What have they done? I think there are eight kind of aggressors. One who is trying to kill someone. Uh, I mean, if someone is trying to kill us, if someone has, uh, uh, if someone is kidnapping their wife, uh, like that, there are eight aggressors, I'm not remembering all of them. Yeah, there are different types of aggressors, all right. Anyway, if this is how it's stated, then this level, this section is relating, is being related on the level of Artha Shastra. But on the level of Dharma Shastra, no, Vedanta Sutra, Vedanta Sutra is, is it Manusamita? Manusmriti Maharaj, Manusmriti. Manusmriti, uh, Manusmriti, okay. So, Manusmriti, this is, um, you see, the but, but from the commentaries of, uh, you know, Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Vishnu Chakrav Thakur, they say these Ego instructions belong to Artha Shastra, like you have said. Yes, right. Killing the aggressors is definitely, this is Artha Shastra. This is not on the platform of Dharma Shastra. So Arjuna is reluctant to kill them. Therefore Arjuna says, sin will overcome us. He's worried. We should always be worried about sinful reactions. We should always be hesitant to act. If we're thinking it's not right, we certainly want to be careful. Devotees very thoughtful. So Arjuna's concluding statement, Nachashreyo Nupashyami. Papam. Papam evasrayat asman, verse 36. Okay, so te text 31 we heard. Let me see. What... I think some of you have to close your mics.
You know, it's very difficult if you have a lot of background noise there going on. Please try to be careful. Text number 36. Sin, sin will overcome us if we slay such aggressors. Therefore, it is not proper for us to kill the sons of Dhritarashtra and our friends. What should we gain, O Krishna, husband of the goddess of fortune? And how, how could we be happy by killing our own kinsmen? Hmm. How could we be happy by killing our own kinsmen? So this is the point that Arjuna is worried about. Swajanam hi katam hadva sukhina shyamamadva. O Krishna, husband of the goddess of fortune, how could we be happy by killing our own kinsmen? No, certainly that's a reasonable claim to be made by Arjuna. Killing our own kinsmen is not a great, it's not, there's no pleasure, there's no credit to someone who has to kill their own people. And Krishna, Arjuna is addressing Krishna that you're the husband of the goddess of fortune. You, you should know this is not right. So going on, Arjuna's got another reason. And he's going to describe about the destruction of the dynasty. So he begins first of all, text number 39, that taking part in the battle, it's going to mean the death of so many elders. Right? Text 39 describes. With the destruction of the dynasty, the eternal family tradition is vanquished and the rest of the family becomes involved in irreligion. So the beginning is with the death of the elders. With the death of the elders, then the, who, who, come, then who takes charge of the family? The, the responsibility is passed on to the not the elders, but the juniors. And the juniors are immature, and they're not very well trained, they're not very well educated. And the result is, the eternal family tradition is vanquished. We see this kind of thing in the world today. You know, the people who lived in India, traditionally they were very religious and pious, but Somehow they become separated from the elders, maybe they move to the West, they get jobs in the West and they go off to the West and they work in the West and they lose their connection with the family and they lose all the culture and all the tradition is lost. And Prabhupada saw himself, Prabhupada went to the West in 1966 and he was sponsored by the Agarwal family, right? The Agarwal family, Prabhupada had met one man, a businessman, somewhere, in, I think it was in Agra or Mathura, and the man said his son was in America. So Srila Prabhupada requested him, can you ask your son to sponsor me? I would like to go to America. So Prabhupada never thought anything more about it, but later on, that man came to Prabhupada and said, my son sponsored you, here's your invitation letter. So Prabhupada took this opportunity to go to America. And so he went to America, and those of you who have read Prabhupada Lila Amrita, you know what happened. Prabhupada went to Butler in Pennsylvania, 
and he stayed with the Agarwal family. This man Agarwal had married an American woman and he was living with his American wife there. And they had a child and they were very nice, very accommodating. Sally Agarwal, the American woman was Sally Agarwal and maybe you've seen her uh, there have been, there's been a few BTG articles about her and some videos made of her. She's a very nice lady and very respectful to Srila Prabhupada. But she's an American. She's not a Hindu. She didn't know anything about traditional culture. But she was very nice to Prabhupada. The point is, anyway, the eternal, eternal family tradition is very... In our eternal family tradition, we're talking about Sanatan Dharma, eternal religious principles. And these things are lost. It's all gone with westernization. It just goes off in the wind. And then the result is, the fa when the family tradition is lost, then the rest of the family become involved in irreligion. The elders die, the traditions lost, and the people take up irreligious activities. Irreligious activities, what do they do for their enjoyment? Uh, initially, previously when the elders were present, they go to the temple. What do they do now? Now they go to the bar, and they go to the club, and they go partying. Oh, so many things, so many sinful things, so many irreligious things. And then what happens? The next thing is degradation of the women. That's a big problem. Right? Degradation of womanhood. It's mentioned. Text 40. When irreligion is prominent in the family, text number 40, O Krishna, the women of the family become polluted and from degradation of womanhood O descendant of Vrishni comes unwanted progeny. Right? In Sanskrit, unwanted progeny, how is it called? What are they called? Unwanted progeny? Varna Shankara. Varna Shankara, right. Varna Shankara, degradation of womanhood. So the women, because the family become irreligious, the men become irreligious, and the women follow them. The women don't stop them, because, you know, the, the women think, well, well, the men are doing it, we also do it. The women follow the men, they become like the men. And they also become involved in irreligion. And the result is, the women are taken advantage of. They're not protected. They're not given the proper protection they're supposed to get. And, and the result is unwanted progeny. Or the Varna Sankara. Right? And that's what we have in the world today. We see everywhere in the world, women go out to work everywhere. Women are all working. They're not protected. They're exploited. When Prabhupada was preaching, there was a, it was a time when there was a women's liberation movement. And Prabhupada was preaching about how women should be protected. And women didn't like it. Prabhupada was explaining women need to be protected. No. But they didn't like it. They thought, no, we want to go out to work. We want to be engineers. We want to do all the things the men do. So they do. Women do everything the men do. And they do more than the men do. Women give birth. Men don't have to give birth. But women, they give birth. And that's when you get the unwanted progeny. 
So that's what creates a problem. And the result is hellish life for both family and the destroyer of the family tradition. The family life is no, no longer peaceful and happy. People live in hell. They just argue and fight with each other constantly, friction and so much divorce. This is the situation in the world today. Community projects, family welfare activities are devastated. All these things are inevitable because there's the whole family mood, the whole community mood, it's all lost. People are all spread out, they're all divided. There's no more love. Destroyer of family traditions dwell always in hell. In text 43. And so this is the stages in the destruction of the dynasty mentioned here by Arjuna. We should be familiar with these things. Certainly very easy to understand, very systematic and progressive. With the death of the elders, the traditions lost, people become irreligious. When people are irreligious, the women also become irreligious and degraded. Women are degraded, you get unwanted progeny and it results in a hellish life. And then community projects and family welfare activities all stopped. Mm. So text number 40, right? We were, we were hearing text 40 describing about the unwanted progeny. So it's mentioned here, Adharma Bhiva Krishna Pradushyanti Kulastriya Strishu Tushtashu Varshneya Jayate Varna Shankara. When irreligion is prominent in the family of Krishna, the women of the family become polluted, and from the degradation of womanhood. O descendant of Vrishni, comes unwanted progeny. I don't know about the situation in your country. I don't know even which country you're all from here today. I know you're from a number of places. But we do find there are many countries in the world today where you have a lot of unmarried mothers or maybe children being brought up in a one-parent one family. And, and the, the mother's bringing up the child on her own, or sometimes the father's bringing up the child on his own. Family is separated. This is an un unnatural condition. It's not pleasant for the child. And the government, somehow, some governments are, they actually facilitate this kind of thing. For example, in, in Australia, I'm told that in Australia, if a woman is unmarried but has a child, then the government will give her a home and they'll give her income. She doesn't have to worry. The government will provide for her. And so some women, they're happy to get a child with, without marriage. And they have the child, they bring the child up without a husband. They think better to have a child without the husband. If the husband is there, it's very difficult. If I have to bring a child up with the husband, very this be always arguing, quarreling, going to end in divorce. And so I have my child, I don't need a husband. You get things like this. It's an unnatural situation. It's not healthy for children. And the result is these children grow up lacking the proper guidance from the parents. And then we get so many social evils, you get drug addictions and so many other things happening.
So Prabhupada comments in relation to this verse, as children are very prone to be misled, women are similarly very prone to degradation. According to Chanakya Pandit, women are generally not very intelligent and therefore not trustworthy. So I want you to consider yourselves. Oh, let's see. Maybe. Yeah, I want you to consider what is the appropriate and inappropriate application of the statement, women are generally not very intelligent. Can we uh, have some groups? How many people do we have here today? Thank you, Maharaj. All right, so then uh, maybe you can go in pairs. Sorry, Maharaj. Just make a, take a partner, pairs, two people together, yes, okay. and you can discuss together what you consider to be appropriate and inappropriate application of this statement. Okay? Shall I open the rooms now, Maharaj? Yes, please. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So you're discussing together? Yeah, yeah, we just start. We're just going to start, Maharaj. Okay. So in terms of uh, Mataji, you have any uh, anything to say first? Sorry? Oh she's not What was that? She's not in uh, I don't know, I can't hear from I couldn't hear from Tulasi Krishna Mataji Maharaj. I think she was about to say something just now. Maharaj, can I check with you a point? Yes. Like for uh, being women being less intelligent, right? We can implement it uh, in real in real life. We uh, we women are like part of inter unintelligent category. category. But then, if in terms of Vaishnavi, we we assume we we can see them as a devotee of Krishna, right? So, in terms of applying that uh, women as a less intelligent uh, category for devotees, do we apply that as well for devotees, Vaishnavis who are serving Krishna and also doing this preaching and all that? Well, definitely. Can we still apply this statement? Definitely, you know. What is a devotee? You say, you know, some people are real devotees and other people, you know, they claim to be devotees. So <laughs> it's not so easy thing, you know. Who do we classify yeah. as being a devotee? Is it just everybody who puts on neck beads and puts on a tilak that they're devotee? Or is it everybody who's initiated is a devotee? There are different levels of devotees. So I don't think we can just simply make it so easy that, oh, okay, I'm a devotee, so I'm different, you know. There are women who are devotees, and there are women who are not devotees. Of course, there's a difference, devotee women. But who is actually really a devotee? What kind of devotee are we talking about? Right? Alright, can you make it a statement like uh, materialistic women who are going behind this material opulences to be lesser intelligence? I mean, uh, in that category. And yeah. Vaishnavis who are spreading Krishna consciousness movement to be, uh, I mean, not to be in that category. Can we do implement that way, Maharaj, a statement? Mm, yes. <laughs> yeah, you can implement it. We want to discuss how should we implement it. 
right? We want to hear from you. What, what, how do you want to implement yeah. this? What is the appropriate way to implement it and what's the inappropriate way? Uh, Tulasi Mataji, you have anything to say, Mataji? Uh, uh, yes, Mataji. Okay, Mataji, uh, in this world we all are Sudras, so, uh, so directly we are not intelligent. Everyone are not intelligent. Am I right, Mataji? Yes. Maharaj, am I right, Maharaj? <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone has some intelligence. You can't say you don't have any intelligence. Every, everyone has some intelligence. You know, some people are more intelligent than others. But, you know, you can't tell me you don't have any intelligence. Uh, but Maharaj, in this Kali Yuga, all, uh, no matter, I mean, everyone in this Kali Yuga are meant to be unintelligent or less, less intelligent, right, Maharaj? <laughs> Yeah, lazy, misguided. In this statement, we take the <laughs> I mean, is this concept still applicable in this Kali Yuga? Yeah. I mean, since we are already being addressed, like those in Kali Yuga are lesser intelligent or not intelli unintelligent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kali Yuga people, we can say that. But still, you have to make the best of the bad bargain. Right? Mm, yes. There's a lot of advantages also in Kali Yuga. A lot of benefits in Kali Yuga you don't get in other Yugas. All right. So, Mataji, uh, okay. could you continue your statement, Mataji, just now? How uh, uh, you wanted to say that out just now? So, the statement is not specifically for women, it's actually for all Kali Yuga uh, <laughs> people. <laughs> yes, right. So, um, uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, behave uh, properly means the whole family was, you know, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. So, you're having a good discussion here? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, remember me, Maharaj? From? From Kuching. Oh, Kuching. Oh, okay. Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Krishna. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are you still in Kuching? Yes, Maharaj, I'm still in Kuching. Hmm. Kripa told me hmm. he became a Sarawakian. Yeah, he, he got a PR. <laughs> <laughs> he got a PR. Yeah, become a Sarawakian. <laughs> yeah. So after this um, COVID, please come to Kuching, Maharaj. <laughs> after. Will there ever be an after, after. COVID? We don't know if we'll after. ever have an after COVID. Yes, Maharaj. Um, so we are discussing about this uh, woman are uh, not very intelligent. In the as to what uh, Prabhu was telling me that uh, in in spiritual we are all spirit souls. Okay? So this is more for those who are not on the spiritual platform, isn't it, Maharaj? Right, yes. Yes. Are you on the spiritual platform? <laughs> Still climbing. <laughs> <laughs> By your grace, Maharaj. Yes. Mm. Still, still, still climbing, still climbing the ladder, haven't reached there yet. <laughs> Okay, so you're. And then, hmm? say again, Maharaj. So you're a devotee. Trying to be devotees, right? 
trying to be a servant of the devotee. Mm. Always serves the devotees. Mm -hmm. And what about Partha Prabhu? What do you say? I'm aspiring servant Maharaj to all the devotees. <laughs> What about, how do you feel about women, though? Are they less intelligent? Women, I think that... What is appropriate? Yes, Maharaj. What's appropriate and what's inappropriate? So, anyone who might be like children, women and old men has to be protected as per Srimad Prabhupada. So, because of their less intelligence, they can be deviated very easily. So, they should be kept in much uh, uh, protected way. And they have a lot of good things they have to offer to the society. So we should focus on the things they can offer to the society and not focus on the things uh, which, you know, not to make a competition between these two. That's not a good uh, idealism. Okay. And so what's the inappropriate understanding then? What's the wrong way to understand this? The wrong way to understand this is that women are fools and they, their words should never be considered. That is the wrong understanding. Hmm? Is that again? To understand that women women are fool and they not consider any of their words or their uh, uh -huh. things. That is wrong. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Okay. Very good. Thank you. This meeting is being recorded. All right. Uh, Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. I think we could close the meetings, Prabhu. Let's bring them back together and hear from them. Uh, close the rooms, right? Shall I close the rooms, Maharaj? Yes, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Is everyone back? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. Uh -huh. yes, Maharaj. All right, so we were discussing, we want to hear about uh, what would be the, in a, first of all, what's the inappropriate way to understand this statement that women are less intelligent and what were some of the other things? Women as a class. Do you remember? What's the quote? Let me find it. Women in general are not very intelligent. So, can we, can we hear from the devotees? The women are not very intelligent and therefore not trustworthy. Women are similarly prone to degradation. Women are like children. So, we would like to hear, let's hear first of all from some ladies. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Go ahead. Yes, uh, women are uh, here. Women are not intelligent because it is said this because of of their tendency to be easily misguided or uh, abused, and because of their emotional vulnerability, Maharaj. Especially, we can see this in the example of uh, Diti, who was so uh, attached that she she uh, wanted mating from her husband at the evening time. 
which was strongly opposed by husband and all so so in that case she was so uh, so much uh, driven by her desires that she did not even hear a good counsel so she was overwhelmed by uh, the desires and sex uh, impulse that she did that and the other example that comes to mind is of a kaikai who had lord ramchandra as her son but still from the wrong guidance by a, a maid servant on no basis she just took a decision of banishing him to the forest so women are not intelligent in the sense they they can't they they are thinking mainly on the bodily concept they are mainly thinking on terms of emotion and because of this they they can be uh, misguided cheated and worsely abused oh so you agree with the statements uh... yes maharaj mm. so how about the application of this statement so should we consider this is true in the case of all women uh, prabhu uh, maharaj sorry in in this uh, case prabhupad has specifically said that those who have accepted krishna consciousness they are not ordinary women and the example of that is he loved his disciples all female disciples equally and he even allowed like matajis to go on altar like in western world even dt worship is performed by females and even uh, yamuna matajis the shringar aarti is played everywhere around the world so it is not we are discriminating based on the body but it's based on the qualities that Uh, it is said women are intelligent but if they accept the philosophy and uh, krishna consciousness then it is it is um, not uh, wise to discriminate against them in that terms okay i think that's a very nice analysis uh you say if a woman has accepted krishna consciousness now that that would vary that how much somebody has accepted krishna consciousness you know could we say that all the women who are members of the krishna consciousness movement are therefore not prone to degradation and we could say that they are also very intelligent and trustworthy uh maraj it would be it depends on the level of their advancement it does not depend on the institution we are in women yes. are still prone but the level of uh, consciousness that is developed it, it is based on on that that's a very good reply thank you maraj i certainly think this is good that it depends on their advancement in krishna consciousness it's not a general rule that all women just because they're members of the krishna consciousness movement they may be initiated and even twice initiated and they may be you know even in managerial positions and so on we do have ladies on the gbc and we have ladies temple presidents and there's a lot of uh, discussion going on that women will also be diksha gurus we don't know but that's under discussion so the position of women inappropriate would be it would be inappropriate to make it hard and fast rule that all women are subject to degradation and in the same way it would be inappropriate to say that the women are not subject to degradation we have to look at their spiritual advancement we have to consider the case of individuals right So thank you Maraji for this contribution. Let's hear from some men. Some with some one of our men, Chaitanya Mangal Prabhu, would you like to speak? Uh Maraji so maybe a uh, way to misuse would be uh in devotee community say uh, if there is an argument or some fight on some uh, something so generally the men might use it to win the argument 
this particular statement that uh, you know Prabhupada has mentioned that women are not so intelligent and you are proving this true. So this will be a misuse of this particular statement in say day to day life. Yes, right. We as men may we may try to use this statement that all women Prabhupada said women are <laughs> And like we may say, so all women are prone to degradation, all women are not very, all women are not trustworthy. Obviously, Prabhupada said it, though did Prabhupada say it? Well, he wrote it, but does it mean every woman? Of course, as Maharaj said, some women are, women are, are also devotees and if they have surrendered to Krishna, if they have surrendered to Krishna, so we have to consider every case on its individual merits. What is their spiritual advancement? How much they have actually taken shelter of Lord Krishna? Right? That's important. And Mariji gave examples in the scriptures of women who uh, showed some faults. We, she gave the example of Diti and how she took advantage of her husband and the result was she gave birth to two demons. And what are some examples of devotee women who are very strong devotees and who are firmly fixed in Krishna consciousness and who show great intelligence and who are very trustworthy? Give some examples from the scriptures. Yes? Am I audible, Maharaj? Yes. Kunti Maharani. Okay. Kunti Maharani. What did she do? Devahuti Mata. Devahuti. Okay. Just a minute, we're on Kunti. Let me hear what did she what did Kunti do? What's her example? I surrender to Krishna. Mm -hmm. Well, did she surrender to Krishna? I mean she had children before her she had she had a child before her marriage. Was that good? You know, she conceived Khan before marriage. And then she put him on a boat and put him down the river, and pretended she didn't know. Nobody knew. Kept a secret. You know, is that is that very good? Is that, is that proper behavior for a woman? What do you say? Yeah? Maris, um, can it be considered as an accidental fall down? <laughs> <laughs> For a devotee? <laughs> well, we have to remember it was, uh, it wasn't Kali Yuga. And with very special circumstances that although she had a child she was able to keep her virginity and somehow at the same time have a child without people knowing about it. She could give birth to a child, the child would take birth immediately without pregnancy. So it wasn't normal, it wasn't the normal kind of pregnancy, it was a very special situation. But in in the more recent Janava Mata, Janava Mata is in the more recent times. Yeah, Lord Chaitanya's Lord Nityananda's uh, had two wives, and one of the wives, Janava Mata, she went on to become the Acharya in the Sampradaya after Lord Nityananda had completed, had finished his pastimes, and was no longer manifest. Then Janava Mata became the Acharya of the Sampradaya. And she was very saintly and she also accepted some disciples. Not very many, but she did accept some persons as her disciples. Yes. And then we have also Lord Chaitanya's own widow, uh, Vishnu Priya. Vishnu Priya. 
after Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, then Vishnu Priya became, was a young woman. She was only 16 years old, but she became very renounced and she maintained her renunciation her whole life. And she spent another 80 years. She was 96 when she left the body. And so she spent 80 years very renounced. It said she would only eat as many grains of rice as she would chant rounds of japa. <clears throat> so she was a very renounced person. It said no one could even see her face. She covered herself. Sita, Sita who? Uh, Lord Ram's wife. Lord Rama's wife, Sita, Ta, Sita Maharani. Of course, Mother Sita is born from the earth. She's also not an ordinary lady. She was born from the earth, not a natural birth. And she's a very uh, divine personality, certainly. Purnamasi. Purnamasi. Yeah. In Krishna Lila, Purnamasi. What did she do? Uh, although she knew, uh, you know, like in the Astakali Lila, we read about it, that uh, in the morning when Krishna was sleeping, so Krishna was having all the red marks on his cheeks. So before Mother Yashoda entered, like, you know, when Mother Yashoda entered, so she used to very cleverly deal with Mother Yashoda and Krishna, you know, hiding all the secrets of Krishna. And uh, she used to very cleverly deal with uh, Mother Yashoda and telling her, that this is the brilliance of the sun which is coming on Krishna's place. This is the brilliance of the Krishna's kundal which is coming on his cheek. So that is how she used to, you know, very cleverly and trustworthy hide the secrets of Krishna with his gopis and deal with the Yashoda Maya and other, uh, you know, senior Vaishnavas, senior uh, family members. Okay. Thank you for that. Interesting. Okay, so generally we see women, uh, Prabhupada explains, here's a quote from Prabhupada. Chanakya Pandit says, never trust the politician and women. Of course, woman comes to Krishna consciousness. That position is different. We are speaking of ordinary woman. Krishna says in another place, Striyo Vaishyas Tata Sudra. All right. Even we be of lower birth, like women, Vaishyas and Sudras. So women are considered low birth. Vaishyas and Sudras are also considered low birth. And in the Kali Yuga, we're all low birth because it said Kalo Sudra Sambhavaha. In the Kali Yuga, everyone is Sudra on lower. And so women are not the only ones of lower birth. We men are also of low birth. But we can all come to the higher position by Krishna consciousness. That is the important point. So women in general, we could say they're, you know, there are materialistic women and there's devotee women. Devotee woman means one who surrendered to Krishna who has really dedicated her life to Krishna. And as one of our ladies uh, said, we have to examine the individual cases. Some people may claim to be devotees and others are actually devotees. We have to look at the individual advancement of each person to understand. All right. Are there any questions or comments on this? Everyone satisfied? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, just another thing I was thinking of, I, I read once, I think it was one day when you said something about the statement about politicians and women. And um, she was saying something like, nowadays all the men are acting or being like politicians. Now the um, men are acting what? Like being like uh, being like politicians, uh -huh. and I guess it's just that nowadays all the men are trying to be somehow like acting or being like politicians. So in her like understanding, it was like the, uh, with the statement Prabhupada meant that 
everyone is, uh, who is outside of Krishna consciousness is either a woman or somehow a politician who is trying to control or trying to do something. And uh, that was what I was reading of her. And I liked that. Uh, All right. Yes, everyone who is outside of Krishna consciousness, then they're either women or politicians, they're in these two categories. We could say that. The question is again, who is actually in Krishna consciousness? Again, as Maharaji said, it's not just a matter of being a member of the institution. There are many people in, in the institution who are not actually practicing Krishna consciousness and they're not really dedicated to Krishna consciousness. We have to consider every individual, the, the circumstances judging each individual and see how much someone has actually dedicated themselves to Krishna consciousness. Then we can understand who is trustworthy and who's intelligent and so on. I also think that, um, I mean, I grew up in a Muslim family and Muslim community, and I mean, I, I still am very much, because I'm still in the family and everything, I still a lot of contact with the Muslim society, and I also see you there, I mean, there are women who are, I think they're like the best, to me, like the best examples of mothers, and very loving, but also very intelligent, you know, like they also read the scriptures and study them, and, and um, I think, I mean, I would say Krishna consciousness goes beyond, <laughs> beyond this one. And if the, all those other traditions or religions who are following, like, and are, are intelligent, and, and, and they also can be considered to be like that. Yes, definitely. You can, some people have a, they have, they have the very strong bonds there with the family. It makes a big difference. Uh, the women in the Muslim tradition are very protected and they have to cover the bodies. It helps a lot to keep the chastity of the women and it protects them from degradation. It's an austerity, of course, but it has its merits, it has its values. Okay, thank you Prabhu. We'll go ahead here. Another quote, this is from Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, sixth chapter. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that when the women become unchaste for want of proper protection, there are unwanted children called Varna Sankara. To insult a chaste woman means to bring about disaster in the duration of life. So the second part of the paragraph here, insulting a chaste lady brings about disaster. So this, of course, this is mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam in relation to, to Draupadi, that she had been insulted. And this brought about disaster in the lives of all those who were present and who did not speak up opposing that. So. Women, in general, they should be protected. They have, they have to want protection. One, one lady, one young lady, I remember one year in Mayapur, she was objecting that she, she was a Western woman, and she said, I don't like being called a walking womb. She objected to people calling her mother. She said, I am not a walking womb. <laughs> The, she didn't like the idea of being, she didn't understand the principle that to address someone as a mother is actually the greatest honor and respect for the woman. But she, rather, she considered it an insult. And so, these are some of the obstacles which we face in trying to give protection to women. And if you ask a woman to cover her body, you know, they think, oh my goodness, you know, what's going on, why this, you know, you know they don't like it. They think, oh, we have to be so primitive, we cannot dress properly. They don't know what proper dress is. So these are, there are many problems in trying to give protection to women. 
It's not an easy thing. We're trying to learn from the culture. If people are brought up in the culture, then it's much easier. Just like as you, Prabhu said in the Muslim families there, they're brought up in that culture. And so it's natural for them to follow the tradition of their elders. Krishna consciousness is different. We're introducing it to people everywhere. So people are coming to Krishna consciousness and they come without that cultural upbringing. And sometimes it's difficult for them. It's difficult to accept. But it takes training. That's the idea. Okay, another question for you. Why did Krishna, who is all-loving, incite Arjuna to war? Would anybody like to respond to this? Why did Lord Krishna, who is all-loving, incite Arjuna to war? Is that an appropriate thing to say about Lord Krishna? Certainly, we know from Bhagavad Gita that Lord Krishna encouraged Arjuna to war. Now, Lord Krishna is all-loving. What would be the reason for Krishna to incite Arjuna to take to battle? Any, any yes, yes, Prabhu? Yes? So, in my opinion, it's the very love that is uh, making Krishna to uh, incite Arjuna to the war because the, those people who are, con who are doing adharma, because of that they are accumulating sin and they will keep doing that unless they are properly punished. And if by punishing them, the sin, the, the soul can be actually relieved of those uh, problems and then it can progress further. So in that way, Krishna wants to establish dharma and uh, kill those you know, dharmas. So you're saying this is Krishna's loving relationship. This is another act of love by Lord Krishna. Yes. Okay. Yes. Everyone agree with this? Any other any other responses? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. yes. Okay, one person. Krishna says. Krishna, Krishna always want to. Hare Krishna. Okay, go ahead, Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj. So Krishna always want to glorify his devotees. That is what the plan of Krishna is. Krishna uh, always want to glorify his devotees. So that's why, in, in order to glorify Arjuna. Krishna wanted Arjuna to kill them all. Like, we had often seen that Krishna had already done that. In uh, Ramad also, we had seen that uh, Ramachandra is giving this instruction to Hanuman. That what do you think? I cannot kill Ravana. I am sitting in his art. I can go and kill him. But in order to glorify Vanar Sena and you all, I am doing all this thing. So that's why, you know, Krishna, in order to glorify Arjuna and part. Okay, very nice point. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Very nice. Yes, someone else had a point? Yeah, yes. Yes, um, yes, yes, Mataji, go ahead. Yeah, also, um, Prabhupada mentioned in the book that Krishna does not tolerate any wrongdoer against the devotee, so that's why he wanted this fight. Okay. He can tolerate any wrongdoer to himself but not for the devotees. Yes, very nice argument. Thank you. Very good. Yes, just one more point, Prabhu. Uh, yes, Maharaj. So, uh, Krishna himself claims in the Bhagavad Gita that he comes for both the re reasons, Paritrana and Sadhana and all in our So, he also comes to kill the sinners. No. Okay. Yes, right. So Krishna is not only loving, both sides are there, yeah. Good, very nice responses, thank you. Let's see what Prabhupada has to say. We'll read, uh, the other side, Duryodhan, why he did not think in that way? Why Arjuna is thinking? Because he is devotee, that is the difference. A devotee thinks like that. A devotee does not like to kill anyone, even an ant. So many atrocities were done. Still, when the question of killing came, he was not very happy. No, this is Vaishnava. He is ready to excuse even the greatest enemy. Well, we heard that before. 
Uh, the devotee of the Lord does not retaliate against the wrongdoer, but the Lord does not tolerate any mischief done to the devotee by the miscreants. All right? This point was also brought up by you devotees. The Lord can excuse a person on his own account, but he excuses no one who has done harm to his devotees. Therefore, the Lord was determined to kill the miscreants, although Arjuna wanted to excuse them. If you insult his devotee, the devotee may excuse, but Krishna will not excuse. This is Krishna's position. Therefore, be careful to insult a devotee. A devotee may excuse you, but Krishna will not excuse you. Krishna is so strict, he cannot tolerate any insult to his devotee. Therefore, this arrangement of fighting Arjuna wanted. No, let them be excused. Krishna wanted. No, you must fight. You must kill them. Right? So this is Prabhupada. Oh, one more, some more from Prabhupada's purport. One has to take birth according to one's activities of life. And after finishing one term of activities, one has to die to take birth for the next. In this way, one is going through one cycle of birth and death after another without liberation. This cycle of birth and death does not, however, support unnecessary murder, slaughter and war. But, at the same time, violence and war are inevitable factors in human society for keeping law and order. The battle of Kurukshetra, being the will of the Supreme, was an inevitable event, and to fight for the right cause is the duty of a Kshatriya. Why should Arjuna be afraid, be afraid of are aggrieved at the death of his relatives since he was discharging his proper duty. He did not deserve to break the law, thereby becoming subject to the reaction of sinful acts, of which he was so afraid. By avoiding the discharge of his proper duty, he would not be able to stop the death of his relatives, and he would be degraded due to the selection of the wrong path of action. This is from the Purport, text 27 of the second chapter. So Prabhupada's Purport is revealing to us why the Lord is encouraging Arjuna in this battle. That Arjuna shouldn't be afraid. He shouldn't be aggrieved at the death of his relatives. They're going to take birth again. He did not deserve to break the law, but there is no sin involved. Arjuna was afraid of it's not sinful to do your duty. Okay, Arjuna cast aside his bow and arrows and down and Arjuna cast aside his bow and arrows, and down on the chariot, his mind overwhelmed with grief. Text number 46, chapter 1. Arjuna put down his Gandiva bow. Now that is interesting, that Arjuna put down his Gandiva bow. Arjuna vowed he would never put down his Gandiva bow. But here, he's so overwhelmed with the situation, that he himself has put down his bow. Hmm. Being an associate of Lord Krishna, Arjuna was above all ignorance. 
But Arjuna was put into ignorance on the battlefield of Kurukshetra just to question Lord Krishna about the problems of life so that the Lord could explain them for the benefit of future generations of human beings and chalk out the plan of life. Then man could act accordingly and perfect the mission of human life. So from Prabhupada's introduction here, Prabhupada's explaining why Arjuna was put into this condition of ignorance, seemingly ignorant condition, that Arjuna was confused what to do, what should he do. But Prabhupada explained this was all Krishna's plan, just so that Arjuna could question Lord Krishna about the problems of life. And Lord Krishna could speak the Bhagavad Gita and then thus guide all of us in how we can uh, live in this world and make proper use of the human life. So the conclusion of the first chapter. From the first chapter it is concluded that inquiry about the self or the Atma takes place in a person who is compassionate in nature and non-violent, and not in one who is cruel and violent. It may appear contradictory, because later on, of course, so much violence is going to be encouraged, and it may appear, appear, appear to be cruel and violent, but we, we have to understand it all properly according to the directions of the scriptures. So from the first chapter, Arjuna is bringing out his nature, expressing compassion and appealing for non-violence. Okay, so we're going to finish here just to summarize what we went over. We saw the, the breakdown of the first chapter. Right? We heard about Arjuna's different reasons for not fighting. Do you remember now, Tosi Priya, Tosi Krishna Priya? What's Arjuna's reasons for not fighting? Com being compassionate. Right, that's the first one, right? Being compassionate. Good. Yes? And what's the second one? Someone else? Prabhu? Enjoyment, Maharaj. Enjoyment, okay. Enjoyment, I won't enjoy the kingdom. And then the third, another one? Sinful, sinful reactions. Sinful, reaction. sinful, reaction. sinful, reaction. sinful, reaction. sinful reactions. He's worried about sinful reactions, right. I'm going to kill people. I'm going to do harm to others. I'll get reactions for it. That's a good reason. And the fourth reason was? Destruction, destruction of, of the dynasty. Tradition. And how, destruction of the dynasty, how does it come about? What happens first of all? What's the first stage of the destruction? The death of elderly the people. The death of the elders, right? And what happens with the death of the elders? After that? The family tradition, family tradition stops. Family tradition stops. Yeah, family tradition is given up. And what then what? Family becomes religion. Yeah, they, they give up the family tradition and they take up irreligious habits. Right. And then with irreligion, what happens? Women become polluted. The women become degraded and polluted. And when the women are de degraded, then? Unwanted, unwanted progeny. progeny. Unwanted progeny. And then more results. What, what, anything else after that? Hellish life for both family and the destroyer of family. Yes, hellish life. And then what happens to the community projects and the family welfare? All devastated. Since elders and families are not there, so there is no proper education and training for the youngers. So they cannot take charge of the family members. So the community projects and the family traditions are all stopped. 
Uh, so, progressive steps leading towards destruction of the dynasty. Now Lord Krishna is going to respond to these different arguments in the second chapter, also in the third chapter. We will see arguments how Lord Krishna, as the expert teacher, remember we've only been hearing from Arjuna so far. Lord Krishna hasn't begun speaking yet. So this is Arjuna giving his reasons why he doesn't want to fight. So when we go on with the second... When we go on with the second chapter, then we will hear how Krishna responds to these different reasons for not fighting, how Krishna is able to defeat each and every one of the four reasons. All right, then we discuss issues of Krishna inciting Arjuna to war, the issue of Krishna inciting Arjuna to war, preaching application, Krishna inciting Arjuna to war. Krishna is all loving. And you gave very nice reasons why Arjuna, why Krishna was inciting Arjuna to war. It was very nice how you responded. You had good reasons. All right, then we spoke about Vaishnava integrity. We talked about women in general. Prabhupada said women in general not very intelligent. I mean, certainly people are not devotees, but if a woman is a devotee and surrendered to Krishna, she's the most intelligent lady. And we offer our respects to them. It would be inappropriate to consider that all women are not intelligent. So it's appropriate to understand who this statement applies to. It's not a general statement that can be applied to everyone. All right, so for, less, for next week, we're going to go on to the second chapter and we'll begin, well, next week we'll go through the whole of the second chapter, again like the first chapter. First chapter we did in two parts, second chapter we'll also do in two parts. So you look over it, Saturday we'll do the first part and Sunday we'll finish. All right? And here's the final quote from Srila Prabhupada. Bhagavad Gita is spoken by the Lord so that human society can be perfectly organized from all angles of vision, politically, socially, economically, philosophically and religiously. From any point of view, human society can be reformed by the Krishna Consciousness Movement. And Prabhupada has very high hopes for our Krishna Consciousness Movement. He wants us to reform the whole world. We have a great responsibility. Okay, are there any questions or comments? Anybody? Okay, there's nothing, then we'll leave you. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj.